First, let me say that I am very surprised by the amount of traction that my previous video received. I am thrilled that so many people found it helpful. In that video, we explored the drag cube model that is used for most parts in Kerbal Space Program, but I specifically called out that wings do not use the drag cube model. Today, we will be taking a look at wings, but before we jump into how they are simulated, we need to revisit the drag equation and introduce the lift equation. As we previously discussed, the drag equation is the coefficient of drag times the area times the density of the fluid times the velocity squared divided by 2. As it turns out, the lift equation is extremely similar, with the only difference being that instead of a coefficient of drag, we have a coefficient of lift. Physically though, what is lift? In my previous video, we talked about how pushing a fluid out of the way creates drag. But what if you push the fluid out of the way asymmetrically? In that case, you get a force that does not point directly parallel to the object's velocity. The component pointing parallel is our old friend drag, but the component pointed perpendicular to the object's velocity is lift. There are actually three different kinds of lift in Kerbal Space Program, applied slightly differently for different parts. Wing lift, body lift, and capsule lift. Note that wing lift comes hand in hand with wing drag. Body lift is used by any part with a drag cube unless explicitly turned off in the part config file. Capsule lift is added in addition to body lift for the non-inflatable heat shields and the Mark 1 and Mark 1 3 command pods. Mark 2 space plane parts, since they have drag cubes, use body lift, but they also have a small amount of wing lift and wing drag as well. All wing parts and control surfaces use wing lift and have no drag cube. Lastly, Breaking ground helicopter blades, prop blades, and ducted fans have their own per part custom lift configs and are out of scope for this video. Something that is important to remember and holds true across all lift types is that lift in KSP is calculated on a per part basis. This means that real life considerations such as sweep angle or aspect ratio do not matter in KSP. The only factors that are considered are the part wing area, the part angle of attack, the Mach number, the absolute velocity, and the density of the fluid. We will talk first about wing lift. Wings are simulated as symmetric flat plates having only two sides. To generate lift, wings must have a non-zero angle of attack. A unique quirk of wing lift is that it is perpendicular to the surface of the wing and not to the airflow. This means some portion of the lift force is always directed backwards. We can separate out this portion and call it lift-induced drag. The remaining portion perpendicular to the airflow we will call true lift. Lastly, we will call the regular drag on the wing parasitic drag, to distinguish it from lift-induced drag. The lift coefficient and drag coefficient of wing parts are simulated via two curves each, an angle of attack curve and a Mach multiplier. These two values get multiplied together to get the final coefficient of lift and coefficient of drag. Let's take a look first at the angle of attack curves. Up to about 20 degrees, lift increases linearly, meaning that doubling the angle of attack doubles the amount of lift. This quickly tapers off at angles of attack beyond 20 degrees, and by 30 degrees we have reached the point of maximum lift. Any increase in angle of attack beyond 30 degrees causes a decrease in lift. This is known as aerodynamic stall. We find that doubling the angle of attack from 45 degrees to 90 degrees only increases drag by about 25% while maintaining about 50% of the lift of the maximum at 30 degrees angle of attack. Therefore, for situations where very high drag is desired, but some amount of lift does need to be maintained, 45 degrees works very well. Now let's take a look at the lift and drag Mach multiplier curves, starting with the lift curve. From Mach 0 to Mach 1, the lift multiplier decays by a factor of about 8, then drops again by another factor of 2 from Mach 1 to Mach 5, after which point it's pretty much static. The drag curve is a little more complicated. An initially high value at Mach 0 rapidly drops to a minima at Mach 0.15, then slowly increases over the rest of the subsonic and transonic regime, then rapidly spikes as we approach Mach 1.1 before dropping off again, then fading slowly as we approach Mach 5. Taking a look at lift and drag individually is all well and good but really what we're interested in is producing the most lift for the least drag. This is called the lift to drag ratio. Let's take a look at a chart of the lift to drag ratio across various Mach numbers. 
At Mach 0, a peak lift to drag ratio of 18 is reached at an angle of attack of 1.5 degrees. This begins rising, and by Mach 0.14, the peak lift to drag ratio is 27 at an angle of attack of 1 degree. This is the maximum possible lift to drag ratio with standard wings. At Mach 0.43, lift to drag ratio and angle of attack match Mach 0. Mach 1.11 is the toughest part of the sound barrier and gives the absolute minimum possible peak lift to drag ratio of 3.2 at 4.9 degrees angle of attack. At Mach 2.54, we have reached the peak possible supersonic lift to drag ratio of 5.3 at 3.8 degrees angle of attack. As velocity increases, lift to drag ratio will slowly decay, but a lift to drag ratio of at least 4.9 is possible up to Mach 8. Boiling this all down, an angle of attack of 2 degrees provides good performance when subsonic. An angle of attack of 4 degrees provides good performance when supersonic and hypersonic. An angle of attack of 5 degrees provides excellent performance for breaking the sound barrier. And an angle of attack of 3 degrees provides a compromise of performance over all speeds. You may have noticed that we're dealing with a bit of a contradiction here. We want to have some angle of attack on the wings so that we can produce a good lift to drag ratio, but we want the body of our craft to point perfectly prograde to minimize body drag. The solution is surprisingly simple. We simply rotate the wings. This is called angle of incidence and is defined as the angle between the longitudinal axis of the fuselage and the cord line of the wing. This allows the fuselage to point prograde for low body drag while allowing the wing to have an angle of attack for plenty of lift. Let's run a head-to-head -head comparison between a craft with wing incidence and one without. This craft has a carefully balanced center of mass and center of lift, with or without cargo. It is powered by two rapiers and two nerves running only on liquid fuel, and has a mass of 72.8 tons, exactly half of which is payload. The only thing we were going to change about the design is adding 5 degrees angle of incidence to each of the lifting surfaces. We can do this by using one snap rotation with the rotation tool while holding the shift key. Before we get started on the comparison, let me just say that the speed up on these clips are not identical. Instead, the speed up values are changed dynamically to make sure that we hit important milestones at the same time in both flights. This is done to make a direct comparison more convenient. Due to reasons that are a little beyond the scope of this tutorial, the plane without wing incidents has a slightly easier time getting off the runway and through the first parts of the flight, but by 140 meters per second, this advantage has disappeared. At Mach 1, the craft with no wing incidents has about 50% higher drag, and this is with a fuselage that is already pretty well optimized. On a more typical design, this is likely to be closer to double the drag. Due to the increased available power, thanks to the lower drag, the design with wing incidence is able to climb more aggressively while accelerating faster, and is pretty much flying itself at this point, aside from occasionally performing a barrel roll to manage vertical velocity. Meanwhile, the craft with no wing incidence has to be babysat, since it can't simply be set to hold prograde, and as a result of the reduced available power, it can't climb as fast or accelerate as quickly. Throughout the supersonic phase of flight, the craft with wing incidence has been experiencing about double the lift-to-drag ratio and half the overall drag of the craft with no wing incidence, and by the end of this phase of flight has reached about 10% higher top speed on jets with significantly less than half the drag of the craft with no wing incidence. After jet burnout, it is entirely up to the nerve engines to finish the ascent to orbit. For the craft with wing incidence, drag makes up less than one half of the thrust available from the nerves, and it can finish the ascent to orbit almost hands-free. Meanwhile, for the craft with no wing incidence, only a tiny sliver of thrust is left available after accounting for drag, and velocity is gained excruciatingly slowly, as pitch is continually adjusted to prevent hold position SAS from raising the nose too high. In the end, the design with no wing incidents reaches orbit with 310 meters per second of delta V left over, while the design with wing incidents reaches orbit 4.5 minutes faster and with slightly over 1,000 meters per second of delta V. This is the difference between being able to do a few maneuvers in LKO and visit a station, or throwing the payload onto a moon transfer and still safely returning to Kerbin. Now let's take a look at capsule lift and body lift. We're going to look at these together because they have a lot of similarities. First. 
They both have no drag components, since they're intended to be used with parts that already have drag cubes. Second, the lift vector is perpendicular to velocity and not perpendicular to the surface, like with wing lift. This means they don't have any lift-induced drag either. They also share an angle of attack curve, which is pretty straightforward. Up to about 25 degrees, it's roughly linear. At 45 degrees, it reaches its peak value, and is roughly symmetrical, about 45 degrees. Their Mach curves do, however, differ markedly. For body lift, the value is pretty constant up to about Mach 1, then dives off a cliff, before stabilizing out at about Mach 5. Capsule lift, on the other hand, doesn't even have a curve for its Mach multiplier. It simply maintains one static value through all speed ranges. The next area in which they differ markedly is how their area is computed, and what their theoretical maximum lift-to-drag ratios are. For body lift, wing area is computed directly from a part's exposed drag cube area. This makes it virtually impossible to come up with a generalized solution for the lift-to-drag ratio of body lift, since drag cube drag has so many more factors at play. For capsule lift, wing area is computed directly off of the wing area in the part action window. Since capsule lift has no drag value intrinsically associated with it, this means that the associated lift-to-drag ratio is theoretically infinite, which plays into the next topic we'll be discussing. If you enjoy watching advanced KSP content, it's likely that you may have heard one of these two terms before. Heat shield wings, or magic wings. What these both refer to is a specific technique of using heat shields that have been carefully occluded to have very low drag and very high lift to create planes that have extremely high lift to drag ratios. In this short segment of the tutorial, I'm going to be showing you how to create and use magic wings. So how do you make a magic wing? First, let's confirm that heat shields do indeed have some wing area. Next, we're going to grab a heat shield and rotate it so that we can place it onto this nose cone via the rear node. As we zoom in, you can see that there are actually two frontal nodes on the heat shield, one a little ways forwards and one hidden almost right inside the heat shield. The important thing here is that the wing area is actually tied to the front of the two nodes. If you attach a part to this node, the wing area of the heat shield will be deleted. What we can do is attach a nose cone to the rear of these two frontal nodes on the heat shield. This will not remove the wing area, but it will occlude the frontal drag cube area of the heat shield, thereby making the heat shield extremely low drag. Then we rotate the heat shield to 45 degrees, since this is the peak of lift for capsule lift, which is what the wing area on the heat shield uses. As we can see here, thanks to the front and back attached nose cones, the YP and YN faces of the heat shield, corresponding to the front and the back respectively, are set to zero, meaning that only the low area, and surprisingly streamlined, side faces of the drag cube are left exposed. I've gone ahead and whipped up this simple little plane here. Rather than having a nose cone directly attached to the frontal node on the heat shield, I've added an additional two heat shields and then put a nose cone on the front most of those. Then I've offset both the nose cones inside the body of the craft where there's a hidden fairing. I've carefully balanced the lift from the heat shields right on top of the center of mass, which means I don't need any control surfaces, which is good because control surfaces use regular lift and so they have a much lower lift to drag ratio than heat shield wings. Let's go ahead and take this thing out for a spin and see what it can do. Once we're up to altitude and stabilized out at our top speed, we can see that each heat shield is producing about 12 kilonewtons of lift, but only 0.01 kilonewtons of drag, which means that they have a lift to drag ratio of about 300. You'll notice that the plane overall has a lift to drag ratio of about 140, which is far, far better than conventional wings can do. What this means is that even though this plane is about 8 tons, it only needs one quarter of a single ion engine to be able to maintain speed. Now you may be wondering, if heat shield wings are so amazing, how come everybody doesn't use them? Well, they do have a couple of drawbacks. The chief of which is that they have very, very poor low speed lift, meaning that takeoff speeds are extremely high. For this reason, most missions that I've seen that utilize heat shield wings take off vertically like a helicopter using regular old props, and then drop into a dive so they can gain enough velocity to fly on heat shield wings. Well, I think that about wraps up this tutorial. I sincerely hope that this information proves useful to you, but if I missed anything, or if you just have some comments and questions, please leave them down below, and as always, stay tuned for the next video.